Hi, in this presentation I want to talk a little bit about the class bivalvia, which of course the bivalves have um, two shells that are connected at a hinge and include animals like scallops, clams, and mussels. You should have a chance or will have a chance by now to dissect a clam in class and so I'd like you to be able to identify certain um, major features. These include being able to uh, locate the gills as well as being able to figure out where the foot is, um, the mantle itself which lines both sides of the shell, um, this muscular foot which extends out of the shell and allows them to wedge themselves into a substrate, the adductor muscles and you'll see over here and here because this picture shows a dissected clam and the the cylindrical muscle has been sliced through, it appears as a circle. Okay, um, In the dissection it was probably too difficult to actually identify more of the these visceral mass organs, but I do want you to have an idea of where they are. Um, I, you also may or may not have been able to see the incurrent and excurrent siphons, but I do want you to realize that water comes in the incurrent siphon, flows over the gills through the mantle cavity and comes back out of the excurrent siphon. Siphon, and meanwhile, um, many bivalves can uh, do filter feeding in in within that process. Another thing I want you to be able to realize is where dorsal, ventral, anterior, and posterior are. And when you have a clam, uh, or even the shell of a clam in your midst, you can look for the umbo, which is that. Uh, apex place where the rings of shell growth originate from and that helps you to identify the anterior okay and so that we know the opposite side then is the posterior and again the incurrent and excurrent siphons um, appear at the posterior of the animal. The dorsal is where the hinge area is and the ventral is below that where the two um, shells come apart and the foot comes out. All right, so once you can tell dorsal, ventral, anterior, and posterior, you should be able to tell whether you have a right hand shell or a left hand shell. In fact, the one that we're looking at right here would be a right shell. These diagrams show um, a number of bivalves kind of in situ or in place within the substrate so you can get a sense of how they're oriented when they're in the sand or in the mud. And um, many um, bivalves have extended siphons like this one here. You have really long siphons. Sometimes these are called long-necked clams. Of course they're not uh, actual necks. And so you can see the foot that wedged itself in and they can take water in and filter it out. Same for all of these other bivalves. And this gives you a little bit of a sense of the diversity, the size, the shape, the, fate, the shape of the foot, the length of the siphons. And um, in some cases, certain bivalves like mussels have these bissel threads that allow them to attach to rocks, either under the substrate like this, or sometimes you see them attached to rocks, uh, sorry, rocks um, above the substrate um, at the edge of the inner tidal area. So the water current that happens through a clam is generated by the action of the cilia um, and these cilia are present on the surfaces of the gill. Okay, so we see a clam here in cross section and you can see the gill flaps actually have a fair amount of complexity to them in these different arches and they're covered in cilia. So the beating of the cilia creates the water current. Okay, so it's not muscular action of the siphons, although if they close the siphons a little bit, they can decrease the amount of water coming in, or if they open it more, they can increase the water coming in or out. Um, but the, again, the current itself is created by the cilia. Okay, so obviously the gills are uh, primarily for the purpose of gas exchange, right? So that they can take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide like other gills in other animals. Um, but gills of many bivalves, especially in the order lamellibranch, and I haven't really asked you to learn the different orders here, but these more um, advanced complex bivalves, um, the gills are also modified to collect food particles from the surrounding water, which is kind of interesting that they use gills both for respiration and for filter feeding. And these clams can process water at pretty high rates. So, so if you have a large number of individuals per square meter, um, and they're all filtering a lot of water, um, this can have a pretty huge ecological impact in terms of um, 
water filtering and keeping the water clear. The, wa the water clarity really can depend on this. So some dense mats of, of freshwater bivalves or even marine bivalves can filter up to uh, 10 cubic meters of water for every square meter of substrate, which is enormous. Okay. Um, I don't want to go through all of the complex anatomical features in the process of particle sorting in, in the interest of time. You'll see it takes up a few pages in your textbook, and I'm really skipping over a lot of that. But I do want you to realize that there's uh, a fair amount of um, interesting stuff that goes on here, and how the uh, particle filtering happens isn't even entirely understood. But um, that's uh, the, basically, in a nutshell, what, what goes on for these guys. I want to take up the topic of um, gas exchange in mollusks, the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And um, even though I'm talking about this in the um, lecture about bivalves, I do want you to realize that the tinnitia of other mollusks also often or most often use this system, which is called countercurrent exchange. And you may have learned about countercurrent exchange in other classes. Um, I'm going to talk about it here in the context of gas exchange, but countercurrent exchange can be used for um, heat regulation. You can see this in the feet of birds and in other animals. Um, it can be used uh, in the um, in excretion, especially in the human kidney. In fact, if you look up countercurrent exchange on the web, the first thing you'll find is that they're talking about it in the context of the nephron unit in the kidney. Okay, so what do we mean by countercurrent? All right. So in the context of a gill, whether it's a molluscan gill or even a fish gill, basically what we're talking about is that we've got water flowing in one direction. And you can see the blue arrow here. The water's flowing this way. All right. Whereas the blood through the uh, vessels that are in the gill, through the blood vessels in the gill, the blood is flowing or the hemolymph is flowing in the opposite direction. So we got water kind of going north here and blood going south in this particular diagram. So you might be wondering, who cares? What's so great about having this countercurrent flow? Well, in a, in a hypothetical situation where you would have concurrent flow, meaning they're both going in the same direction, Watch what happens to the diffusional gradient, okay? So up at the top here, this is water flowing, um, and that let's assume that when the water first comes in that it's 100% oxygenated, all right? And then as the oxygen diffuses into the blood vessel, um, the water is losing oxygen. So we're going 80, 60, 50 here, okay? Because the water's losing oxygen. And the blood is gaining the oxygen, right? So it starts with zero in our hypothetical situation. Then it's got 15%, then 30%, then 50%. So look what happens as you go along the length of a blood vessel is that you tend to reach an equilibrium, okay? So what happens to diffusion when it reaches equilibrium? It basically stops. There's no further exchange that's going to happen because you're at this uh, equilibrium. Okay. So, so the big thing here is if you run the water and the blood in opposite directions, you get this countercurrent flow. And what the countercurrent flow does is it allows you to maximize the diffusional gradient. Okay, I'm trying to write this out here because this is really important. You maximize the diffusional gradient. Sorry if that's not that clear. But the idea is that the steeper the gradient, right? 100 to 0 is much steeper than 100 to 99. The steeper the gradient, the quicker the rate of diffusion. Okay, Or at least if there's any gradient at all, you'll still have diffusion happening. right? So if the water's coming in this way and the blood's going out that way, um, what's going to happen is that there's always a difference between the amount of oxygen in the water and the blood. So the amount of oxygen in the water is always going to be higher than that of the blood. So we maintain the diffusional gradient across the entire surface of the gill. See, we have this 5, 0, 20, 10. Even if it's not always that steep, at least there's a difference. It doesn't reach the equilibrium like it would be if there was concurrent flow, which there's not, okay? So um, in countercurrent flow, we keep the diffusional gradient going, and so we maximize the use of the diffusional gradient across the entire length of the gill.
this image kind of shows what I was just talking about in that other image without numbers. Basically, that's what this um, here is. If, if you have the concurrent situation on the left here and a concur uh, a, a, a um, sorry, a concurrent situation on the right here, and the countercurrent situation is on the left. Okay, and I, again, I want you to remember that um, concurrent flow doesn't really happen. This is if it would happen, this is why it would be bad. Okay, that's what we're trying to say here. So countercurrent on the left. Uh, so what happens uh, if you look at the graph here is that increasing distance that you move along the gill, right, the blood continues to gain oxygen as the water loses it. Instead of them uh, both coming to this equilibrium point where half of the gill is not going to be useful in acquiring oxygen at all. I hope this makes sense. Uh, if it doesn't, please bring any questions to class and we will talk about it then.